Welcome again, dear friends, to the second day of our reflection, praying with the Bible, Psalms for Life. Yesterday, we had a prayerful experience of Psalm 130. And as I promised you yesterday, maybe I'll put on a little bit of my teaching hat and speak to you about a little bit about the background of the Psalms. It's so important for us to understand this background if we are going to appreciate the Psalms even more and therefore to pray it more meaningfully. First of all, where do we get the name Psalms? It actually comes from the Greek word Salmoi, which in the Hebrew is called Mismor, which means a stringed accompaniment to some songs. Now, we have about a 150 psalms. And as I said yesterday, of varying moods, varying occasions, sung at different places as an individual, as a community, as a liturgy, going up to the temple. So different reasons and for different seasons. Now, it was done over a large period of time. The earliest psalms, say, would be dated toward the 12th century BC, and the latest would be around 3th century BC. That means this entire book of 150 psalms would have taken about a thousand years before it finally came into one book. Now, the book of Psalms, you'll have the individual Psalms that have titles. Most of them have titles, only 34 don't have titles. And the titles are quite indicative. They'll say it's addressed to the choir master, it's addressed to certain figures like Asaf. It also indicates it's a Psalm of ascent, that means people who are on pilgrimage. It's a Psalm of Tefilim, which means prayer. So there are different titles to each of the Psalms that give you a sense of what that Psalm is all about. A question that is often asked is, now who is the author of these Psalms? According to traditional legend, it's attributed to King David. Attributed is not the same as authorship. Because what we have is, it's true, David had a certain reputation of being a poet and a musician himself. As the king, he was the patron of the arts, of musicians, poets, and singers. And so it was tradition that attributed that the writing of the Psalms to David. Now, as we said, I'm constantly using the word attributed, not authorship, because authorship then is not understood as it is today. Because when we look at the history, as I said, it took more than a thousand years for the Psalms to be written. Some of these Psalms were written long after David died. 
We have, for example, Psalm, Psalms of the temple. Psalms later, even after the destruction of the temple. However, this entire body in popular understanding, not in rigorous scholarship, attributes it to King David. What we also have here is in the Psalms, as I said, you've got varying moods and experiences. But when you're reading the Psalms, you will find one thing that could be quite challenging, if not disturbing. The language that we find in some of the Psalms. Because they contain raw experience, raw expression, and raw language. You have a feeling that the psalmist, the one who wrote the psalm, did not weigh his words well. He said it as he saw it or said it as he felt it. Particularly when he or she was going through a difficult moment. Particularly when they were going through a very painful moment and they feel hemmed in by the enemies all around. At that time, they're not going to sing a very peaceful psalm like the Lord is my shepherd. At that time, they are going to say, may the enemies fall into the very trap that they have set for me. In other words, in their pain, they are crying out almost to the point of cursing that the evil that the others are planning on me, may it bounce back on them. And that kind of language you'll find in some verses of the Psalms. But when we look at the entire body of the Psalms, which is quite vast and quite broad, we find that in the language of the Psalms, we can extract, as it were, a little bit of the theology of the Psalms. And I'd like to very quickly speak to you on three different themes. The Psalms reveal to us our understanding of God, the qualities of God. So for example, quite frequently we'll hear the qualities of God like what we saw yesterday, He said, the steadfast love of God, of God who unfailingly loves us. Or again, we have God with the Hebrew word rehem, which means compassion or mercy. You have God as the shepherd. You have so many titles and images that come to us through the Psalms. God who is our rock, God who is our refuge, our stronghold. And so the Psalms will reveal the different qualities, the attributes of God. So as we pray the Psalms, we are beginning to get glimpses of the vast dimension of who God is and who God is for us. A second theme, overall theme that we would have in the Psalms is that of persons. Not only as individuals, but as members of the community. And so therefore you'll find sometimes some of the Psalms are individual laments, some of them are community laments. Some of the Psalms will be individual thanksgiving, others would be community thanksgiving. What we also have with regard to persons is the longing that the Psalmist expresses. My soul yearns for you like a dry, weary land without water. Psalm 42. This longing for God, when can I enter and see the face of God? That's another dimension that we see in the Psalms. And the third is a tremendous concern for the poor, the broken, the crushed, the oppressed. The language used is anavim, God's special concern for these. So we have one whole theme of the understanding of God, the second is regarding persons. And the third is really about the covenant. The entire Old Testament speaks about God in covenantal language. I will be your God and you will be my people. And this is expressed with different images. 
a shepherd and the sheep as a mother and the child or the father and the child so there are different ways that this whole dimension of the covenant comes out and as you read the psalms you begin to have a sense not only of who god is not only of our human condition and how we respond to god but special concern in the light of the covenant because the old testament had a series of covenants the covenant with noah manifested by the rainbow the con- covenant with abraham the covenant with moses and so the covenant with david and then finally when we come into the new testament we will see jesus proclaiming the new covenant how do we look at the psalms the book of psalms first of all we must give credit to where it is due the book of the psalms arose in the jewish context that the jewish heritage the jewish patrimony in fact we have a very interesting symbol here a very strong jewish symbol called the menorah that is the candlesticks that you will find in any synagogue and a placing of the menorah here is to remind us of the jewish origin of the psalms the jews prayed the psalms regularly in the synagogue in their personal prayer it was part of life and therefore jesus as a jew prayed frequently the psalms it was his way of connecting with the father in fact on the cross he cried out one of the last words from psalm 22 my god my god why have you forsaken me that's his cry from the cross though it's interesting to see how that psalm proceeds further on and how it ends we'll have to wait for one of the later sessions of this pray with the bible psalms for life we will be handling that psalm at a later date so while today we celebrate it in the christian context we must not forget that its roots come from judaism from the jewish world so not only jesus prayed the psalms but we now begin to see the psalms in the light of jesus paul frequently makes reference also to the psalms the early writers of the church what you would call the fathers and the mothers of the church also drew rich richly on this heritage of the psalms and hopefully as we go this month through this month we you and i will make the psalms so much more part of our life our prayer life and to nourish our faith it's very very important for us therefore to draw on this psalms that we have what we can probably now do is to look at one brief psalm that we will take today the psalm that i present to you today is psalm 117 it is the shortest psalm in the book of psalms and the shortest chapter in the entire bible it's interesting psalm 117 is the shortest psalm but psalm 119 is the longest psalm don't worry we are not going to do it during these days together but psalm 119 is the longest psalm and the longest chapter what we will look at today is particularly to pray psalm 117 you know just before i look at this psalm i want to sh- share an an anecdote on a certain occasion a very religious jewish man was there with a very pious christian woman and so she said to him come 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 let's pray the psalms together 
And he said, no, we will recite the Psalms together, but we will pray them separately. Why was he saying that? The point he was making is, the Jewish people read the Psalms as they received it. As Christians, we read the Psalms not only as it has been received, but for us it is interpreted through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We see the Psalms being manifest and fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And so when we pray the Psalms, we are praying it with a very Christic, Christological center. For us, Jesus is the Messiah. And it is his life that we seek to celebrate in the Psalms. That when we address God and Lord, we address not only the Father, but also the Son and the Spirit. We call the Psalms inspired literature because it has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. But it is not enough for us to say that the Psalms are inspired. It is important for us that even as we sit and sit down to pray, that we invoke the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is at the heart of every prayer. The Spirit not only inspires sacred literature, the Spirit enables us to pray. And it is with the same Spirit that we now take the briefest psalm that we have. As you will soon see on the screen, this psalm is presented not only in English, it's only two verses, but also popularly in Latin. Because a number of people know this psalm not only in English, but in Latin as well, and they sing it at certain celebratory moments in their life, in their family, at their functions. And so we will take a look at this psalm. Let us be very conscious now that we are embraced by the Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who was there when the psalm was inspired is the same Holy Spirit now who's helping you and me to pray it. Not superficially, but from the heart. And so very consciously let us just sit comfortably in the presence of God. Enveloped by His presence, Strengthened by his love. It might help if you close your eyes. As I pray out the psalm aloud. And as I pray it aloud, just allow it to echo in your heart. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord is another, it's the English way of saying hallelujah. Because the word hallel means praise. And the ya is short form for Yahweh. So hallelujah is praise the Lord. In this psalm, the structure is, there is a call to praise. It's a command, praise the Lord, it's imperative. All you nations, in other words, not just Israel, but all the, all the nations. 
extol him all the peoples, not just the Jewish people, but all the peoples, what they call the Gentiles, meaning people who are not Jews, but the entire world. First is the call to praise. That's the first verse. Then in the structure, the second verse is the cause or the reason to praise because God's love is steadfast. And finally, the conclusion, praise the Lord. And with this structure, let us now enter deeper into this prayer. Together with all the nations, we also want to praise the Lord. Together with all peoples, we want to extol the Lord. Why do we want to praise Him? Because He made us. Because he redeemed us. Because he protects us. When should we praise him? Praise Him when we see the marvels of nature, a beautiful sunrise, a beautiful sunset. Praise Him when we see His hand in our lives that guides and directs us. For great is his steadfast love towards us. Verse 2. Steadfast love, chesed, is the word in Hebrew. Unwavering, unflinching, never diminished. Have you allowed yourself to experience that? Have you been alert? The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. See the language. God never gives up on us. The faithfulness, we might not be faithful, but His love is faithful forever. Let us allow the Lord to love us. Let us allow ourselves to experience his faithfulness. We ask ourselves, how do I witness to this God? How much of my life is a mirror of who God is for me? Do people see in me and in you God's caring love? 
Not a selfish love for oneself, but a love that opens out to others. Just as God loves me. How loving and caring am I in the home to those in need, to those who are broken and burdened with life? And so we conclude this psalm as we say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Maybe we could just sing this. Join me along if you know it. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee, thus will I bless thee. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Thank you, dear friends, for joining us for this experience of uh, praying with the Psalms. Tomorrow being Friday, it's the first Friday of the month, we're going to have the adoration. Same time, 7 o'clock, please make sure you're there. And on Monday, we resume this praying with the Psalms. So I invite you, dear friends, to pass this word around. Share this link so that we will have even more people together praying these psalms as we honor the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Thank you once again. Good night, and God bless you all. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is up the battle let the anthem ring to Christ our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He.